Hello, my name is Barb Farrell. I'm a pharmacist in the Briere Geriatric Day Hospital and one of the investigators of the Deprescribing Guidelines Program of Research at the Briere Research Institute in Ottawa. Our research team has developed several evidence-based guidelines for deprescribing. Deprescribing refers to the planned and supervised process of dose reduction or stopping of medication that may be causing harm or no longer be of benefit. Each guideline includes a two-page algorithm to help make decisions about when to reduce or stop a medication and how to do so safely, while managing other symptoms that may arise. This video shows how to use the benzodiazepine receptor agonist deprescribing algorithm. Also called BZRAs, this class of drugs, sometimes called hypnotics or sedatives, are commonly used for insomnia among other conditions. The algorithm has a front side with the step-by-step -step process for deprescribing and a backside with more information to help with the process. Our first case is Denise, a 65-year-old woman requesting a renewal of her lorazepam. Her BZRA was started by her primary care provider about 10 years ago, shortly after the death of her mother. She takes just a few other medications. Starting at the top of the algorithm, we ask ourselves, why is Denise taking a BZRA? We know it was started to treat insomnia related to the death of her mother. Since starting the BZRI, she's taken the medicine religiously to help her fall asleep at night. She acknowledges that she's a bit unstable at night when she walks to the bathroom and that she feels hangover effects and daytime sleepiness in the mornings. She denies having other sleeping disorders such as restless leg syndrome, has never been treated for anxiety or depressive disorders, or other conditions that might cause insomnia and states she only has occasional alcohol with no issues related to withdrawal. Based on this description and the fact that she does not have a history of an underlying anxiety disorder, she may be unwittingly using the BZRA without receiving beneficial effects and whilst compromising restful sleep. High quality research shows that after four weeks, the sedative effect of BZRAs wears off. This means that Denise may sleep but she will not feel any more rested or alert than without sedatives. As well, the negative effects of BZRAs continue long after the attenuation of the sedative effects. These effects include physical dependence, falls, memory disorder, dementia, functional impairment, daytime sedation, and motor vehicle accidents, the risks of which increase with age. To double check that she does not have a reason for continuing BZRA use, it's important to make sure she does not have an anxiety or depressive disorder or other untreated physical or mental illness. Insomnia is a symptom of many disorders such as depression and anxiety, and in order to improve the success of deprescribing, we recommend treatment for any pre-existing medical or mental health condition. This may involve consulting with a psychologist, a psychiatrist, or a sleep specialist. Based on her medical chart information and her own recollection, Denise does not appear to have an anxiety or any other untreated mental or physical disorder. Medications and other drugs may also interrupt or delay sleep, for example, caffeine and alcohol. Upon careful questioning, Denise states that she drinks only two cups of coffee each morning to get her going, then tea with lunch and supper. She has a glass of wine on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday evenings with supper. Denise appears to be a good candidate for deprescribing of her lorazepam. As she is 65, she's on the cusp of the increased risk of side effects due to increasing sensitivity with age. BZRAs are not recommended as first-line insomnia therapy in this older age group, primarily due to the risk of adverse effects. Tapering and stopping the BZRA for this age group is considered a strong recommendation from a systematic review of BZRA studies and use of the GRADE approach. Even at a younger age, a conversation about possible deprescribing should still have occurred to help her make informed decisions about continued use. The notes on the back side of the algorithm stress the importance of a conversation about deprescribing to explain the rationale, for instance, the side effects of BZRA use, and that long term therapy is rarely indicated due to the attenuation of the sedative effects in the context of continuous harms. In addition, withdrawal symptoms are usually mild and transient. Withdrawal insomnia, for example, peaks within a few days and resolves over a few weeks. Knowing this can help patients buy into the plan. 
Patients also have indicated that they would feel better about deprescribing if they knew the plan and indeed could help direct the dose tapering amounts and schedule. These recommendations are informed by interviews with patients about facilitators for deprescribing. In terms of tapering doses, there's no published evidence that suggests switching to long-acting BZRAs reduces the incidence of withdrawal symptoms or is more effective than tapering shorter-acting BZRAs. Denise says she's comfortable with stopping her lorazepam gradually. She may still face some withdrawal symptoms, but they'll be less severe than if she tries to stop cold turkey. Education on sleep hygiene principles will be an important starting point, the details of which are highlighted on the back side of the algorithm. Denise didn't realize that her caffeine and alcohol consumption could make insomnia worse. She's decided to switch to decaf tea at lunch and supper and to avoid drinking wine on the nights when she wants to get a good night's sleep. The plan for tapering Denise's lorazepam slowly first involves checking the sizes in which the drug is available. With 0.5 mg, 1 mg, and 2 mg sized tablets that can be split, there's lots of room for a personalized plan. You and Denise decide to conduct a slow reduction as follows. 1.5 mg at bedtime for the next two weeks, at bi-weekly intervals reducing to 1.25 mg, then 1 mg, then 0.75 mg, then 0.5 mg, then every other night for a week, and then stopping. Denise decides a stop date will be during a week when she doesn't have much going on, as she knows to expect withdrawal insomnia for a few nights. By then, she will have switched to decaf tea and reduced her morning coffee to half decaf to make it easier to sleep at night. We'll monitor every one to two weeks for the duration of the tapering to check if Denise has improved daytime alertness or any problems getting to sleep. We can have her visit, call her, or just ask her to let us know if any unusual symptoms return. We'll also recommend non-drug sleep hygiene approaches to insomnia and could discuss cognitive behavioral therapy if Denise is still bothered by insomnia after stopping her lorazepam. CBT has been shown to be an effective treatment for insomnia. Three months later, after a gradual tapering and stopping of the lorazepam, Denise continues to practice sleep hygiene and reports that she enjoys her natural sleep that is returning over time. Our next case is Ricardo, a 79-year-old Spanish-speaking recent immigrant from Colombia living with his daughter's family. His family are concerned after two recent falls at night. He's been taking diazepam 5 mg at bedtime for many years, and they describe him as being sleepy all the time and sleeping often during the day in his room with the curtains closed. Because we are unsure about why he's taking the BZRA, we ask Ricardo's family questions on whether he's ever had an anxiety disorder or depression, whether he's seen a psychiatrist, and whether the medication may have been started while in hospital for sleep or possibly due to grief. Ricardo and his family have no idea, and they can't recall a hospital admission or a mention of anxiety, so that helps us decide it's likely safe to try deprescribing his BZRA. We talked to Ricardo and his family about the rationale and the process for deprescribing. It's important to explain how the sedative benefits attenuate and the side effects, including falls, memory loss, daytime sedation, and accidents persist. They agree to deprescribing in order to reduce risk for their father. Ricardo and his family feel more comfortable tapering the long-acting diazepam slowly rather than stopping it abruptly, even given the recent falls. They decide to reduce the dose to 2.5 mg at bedtime for a week and then to stop it. The plan is to monitor every one to two weeks for the duration of the taper and for a few weeks after discontinuation. Ricardo and his family report some anxiety surfacing early on. The family has private insurance and so Ricardo was referred for cognitive behavioral therapy to reduce his anxiety and to help him sleep. This involves working with a psychologist over several sessions to discuss stimulus control, sleep restriction, sleep hygiene, and relaxation training. CBT has been shown in trials to improve sleep outcomes with sustained long-term benefits. Ricardo and his family make some specific changes, like setting an alarm to get up at 8 a.m. every morning, keeping the curtains open during the day, and avoiding napping, 
moving the TV from his bedroom to the living room, getting out for a daily walk, and going to bed at a regular time. He also agrees to slow the tapering schedule by staying at 2.5 mg at bedtime for a few weeks, then reducing to 2 mg at bedtime for two weeks, and then to 1 mg for two weeks. The family asks about other sleeping pills, but you discourage it because other medications may not be effective or safe. However, early concerns about sleep and anxiety resolve with counseling and education. Over time, Ricardo is able to sleep naturally. His daytime sedation resolves, he becomes more interactive with his family, and the family reports no more falls. I hope you found these examples helpful to understand how to use the BZRA deprescribing algorithm to make decisions about when and how to reduce BZRA use. Remember, the goal of deprescribing is to reduce medication burden and harm while maintaining or improving quality of life. It should always be done with planning and supervision by a healthcare professional to make sure it's appropriate and safe. The deprescribing guidelines project was initially funded by the Government of Ontario through the Ontario Pharmacy Research Collaboration, with recent funding through the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. I'd like to thank our team of investigators and staff, as well as those who contributed to developing and reviewing each of the deprescribing guidelines and algorithms included in this important initiative.